all of Paris has been tuned into rugby, perhaps as never before. But Andrew puts it high. Blanco under it, McCarley's there. Blanco has to take it in the air. He's hit by Winterbottom. I think the key thing here, as we did with Georgia, was we just need to take you back to an 11, 12-year-old Henderson Chalmers Winterbottom. Where, where we, um, Craig, I'll start with you. Was rug, where was rugby in your mind at that age? Were you thinking this could be it for me? Um, not really. I, I was brought, brought up in a town called Melrose in the Scottish borders. And that's the place where the game of sevens was invented by a guy called Ned Haig. So to be fair, rugby was a sport that was played in the borders. Gala, hoik. Um, there wasn't much football. So yeah, I didn't really have much choice apart from rugby um, or golf. I played, I played most sports, but yeah. I went to play rugby when I was five years old, played right through um, the age groups, but yeah, it's a, yeah, I had nothing else in my life. I wasn't very good at school. Um, so yeah, I love my sport and uh, I had a fun time afterwards playing it at a great level. And uh, Winters, what about you at, uh, you know, as a son of a Yorkshire farmer? What, 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 when, how important was rugby to you at the kind of the age that the kids in this room are? Well, I mean, rugby was sort of a massive part of the family. And my, my dad uh, played a little bit, and then he was an administrator. He was secretary and then chairman of Headingley, which is now Leeds. Um, I used to get dragged down to, uh, to games to ball boy. So from the age of probably three, I was a ball boy at Headingley. And uh, the good thing about it for me was that I, I was able to play rugby in the dead ball area after the games. Um, under the sort of lights of the clubhouse. And um, I loved it. I just thought it was just fantastic. And I did that. I didn't actually play proper rugby until I was uh, 11 when I went to senior school. But I knew everything about rugby by then. And uh, so I had a sort of head start on all the other kids. Um, but yeah, it was uh, great times. And, you know, I remember my mum used to come out at about sort of seven o'clock at night and sort of drag me off by the collar and my, me and my brother and, uh, and drag her. We were covered in mud after rolling around and playing rugby. And that was the way, uh, yeah, that's how I learned to, to play, I guess. And, and what about Henderson Jr.? What was he like? Um, legend. <laughs> I'll, uh, I'll, I'll be perfectly honest with you, at, uh, at that age I didn't know whether rugby ball was pumped or stuffed. Um, I'm going to be speaking slowly so that you can uh, have my Irish lilt, by the way. Um, I wouldn't want any of you to, to misinterpret that for anything else. Uh, having an Irish mother, a Scots-Indian father, being born in Dover, which nearly makes me Albanian, make me quite confused. We saw a one earlier on, one of the greatest players to ever play the game, probably the greatest player to ever get, play the game, Pele. When I was a youngster, I actually thought that I was the, uh, the next Pele. We had a lot in common. Uh, we both had heads. I had no left foot, right foot, couldn't head the ball and didn't know where the net was. But um, I went to a rugby playing school. I went to Tiffin School. And this is something for, uh, for anyone out here that uh, is interested. Um, they nearly kicked me out because I refused to play rugby. I refused to play rugby and actually I left school, um, I left school early, uh, most days. <laughs> um, but um, I, left school at, uh, I left school at 17 and went to watch a friend of mine play at a local uh, rugby club, Kingston Rugby Club. It's fantastic. Our, uh, our clubhouse is a porter cabin. Um, our chef was a vending machine. I was standing on the, on the sideline, and this is not an advocation of drinking or any other vices, but 
but I was having a pint and a, a silk cut purple, which was my cigarette of choice at the time. And they were one short and they asked me to play. I played, scored a hat trick, kicked all the points and, uh, and then it kicked on from there. And then really were a legend. Huh? And then you really were a legend. No, then I really got into drinking and smoking. All right. <laughs> Talking of smoking, you must tell one story about your career a bit further down the road where rugby and smoking collided. First and foremost, kids don't smoke, it's bad for you. Um, unfortunately, I, uh, I, I do have that vice. Um, uh, and I used to room with a fellow called Peter Classy. I don't know whether you ever come across him. He was a prop, played for Munster, played for Ireland. He got banned from the Northern Hemisphere for uh, clattering Olivier Rumar's head. Actually, Olivier Rumar's head clattered into his foot. <laughs> Travesty of justice. And uh, we used to room together and we had the same habits. And one day we were playing against South Africa at Lansdowne Road. Great place to be, the old stadium, creaking, concrete, noise, everything. And uh, we go downstairs into the change room under the tunnel, we walk in, we sit down, we put our socks and shorts on. Peter Classy being the consummate professional, this is my third or fourth cap, looks at me and says, Hendo, do you fancy a fag? I said, of course we will, Class. The rest of the team has wandered out. They're all on the field warming up. We've walked out of the change room, turned right through where they do the drug testing. Hey, lads, we're just going for a Harry. Into the plant room. We've had a quick cigarette. He was on Benson Hedges at the time. Um, came back out, warmed up with the team. Everyone back in. We're playing South Africa. We've got Warren Gatlin as our coach. He's inspirational. He's led us into into actually becoming a bit more of a unit, a solid unit, and a competitive team. Big squeeze beforehand. I've got myself a personal trainer, by the way, at this stage. Thank you. I'm still in shape. <laughs> and, um, and we go out onto the field, and I intercepted the ball after about five minutes. It's nil-nil, Lansdowne Road, 49,500 people. South Africa, superb team at the time. Underdogs, massively Ireland. I intercepted the ball on the 22. Not really my distance. <laughs> really my distance but uh, I decided right what did Warren Lachlan my coach say right hook in the head arms around the legs high knees extra inch claw foot and everything I'm over the 10 meter line I'm thinking hang on there's clear air here there's every t I'm going to score and taking into account I didn't score that many um, over the halfway line Jesus Christ what did he say keep driving the arms high claw the foot high knee hit in the head and over the 10 meter line, I'm thinking, Jesus, there's going to be a bronze statue outside the dart station. People are going to, <laughs> people are going to rub it on the way in for decades to come, remembering the try that the fat lad scored against South Africa at not really his distance and got into the 22 and suddenly it hit from the side. I think it was Brayton Pulser who was rapid. I mean, really, really quick. Had to be to catch me. And I've landed on the floor, and honestly, I thought I'd broken my leg. There was a sharp pain in my leg, and I'm screaming on the floor, and the game's carried on, two or three phases. Eventually, the referee starts, he's blowing a hole, and he's come over, and the, the, the physios come on, and everyone's come on, and they're all sitting around me, are you okay? And I was in absolute agony, and, I, and, and it was only at that point, it was only at that point, and this was the day when you had sh pockets in your shorts, that I put my hand in my pocket, and I brought out an orange clipper lighter where I'd had the bag. <laughs> We saw, and I'd landed on it sideways on, and the referees just looked at me and said, Jesus. Now, the, the elephant in the room, or the pterodactyl, or whatever is in the room, so let's just get it out of the way. Just be interested to hear what the three guys got to say. I'm sure any of you here who've got sons, daughters who play rugby have been talking about nothing else all week but about the height of tackles and what your kids are going to be playing next season and things like that. So just a quick sort of straw poll here. Pete, I'll start with you. What, what's, what's your take on lowering the tackle, safety of the game, blah, blah, blah? Because in many ways, this is all being driven by the schools largely. So what's your take on what it means for the future? Well, is it driven by the schools? Is it? Well, it's been know. driven by a lot of schools. I don't know. I, I, John, I, I think that it's, uh, it's a very controversial thing that the rugby union have done. I think that the way that they've communicated it to the, 
to the to the to the rugby public has been appalling. Um, I, I'm not sure that that lowering the height. Um, I think I think lowering the height from you know we don't want to have head on head clashes and we don't want to have shoulders on heads and we want to try and uh, reduce concussions and we try try and reduce all injuries. Um, but uh, the way they've just gone out with this the statement that they want everybody to tackle now from the waist um, has been absolutely ridiculous. And um, you know there is there is. I think that there's a lot more research to be done and um, to, 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 to make it, you know, I know that there's been a lot of research or there has been research so far, but to make it, um, you know, that everybody can buy into it because we all love the game of rugby and, um, you know, we, we all love, enjoy playing it and we, we, we obviously don't want it to change that much, but I think most of the players and coaches and administrators and people in rugby would be happy that they changed it to change slightly to make it slightly more, um, you know, less uh, dangerous. But it's still going to be, you know, whatever you do, it's still going to be, you know, a contact sport. Which is the part of the reason why any of us play it, of course. Craig, thoughts? I was a fly half in the late 80s, at 90s, and, uh, and basically yeah. tackling really wasn't well, a thing that I did very much. So... Um, <laughs> I don't really have an opinion. I, no, I do have an opinion. On it. I think it's got to be safe. Um, I think things are badly handled by the RFU. Um, I was with a guy called Luke Pierce at Twickenham yesterday at a lunch, and he was basically going against what the RFU had just brought out. He works for them. So he is talking about it being not, not waist height. It's basically going to be below, below your armpits, basically. And I think that's a a fair, a fair, uh, you know, Compromise. sacrifice. But I think it's like, you know, you can go in the motorway and you can drive at 78, 79, all right, and not get, and not get stopped. So I think they're looking at the waist, well, it's tackle there, you're not going to get penalised. I think that's what he was sort of saying yesterday. So um, it's got to be safe. I, we want kids to play the game at all ages, to all levels. And I think there's been a massive drop-off in the last couple of years from 300,000 in England to 175, I think. So, you know, that's a massive drop-off. We need to get back, get young kids back playing, get the confidence back into the parents to let them play, um, because that's really been a big, uh, big hurdle. And the wise Irish owl says what? <laughs> <laughs> He's always got an opinion. <laughs> so. Well, I'm a big advocate of bringing back shoeing, so uh, you're not going to get much out of this, but... No, in, and hair dye for centres. 100%. But, um, but, in, but in fairness, I think uh, making the game safe for the next generation coming through is obviously paramount. Um, it's something that we want our children to do. And as parents, as supporters, we want the game to be safe. We want something that's going to be, um, have longevity. But let's not lose sight of the fact that this is a contact sport. It's a physical game. And, and I think I agree with Craig that if, if you lower it a bit below the, height, below the waist height, um, I mean, I used to run with quite high knees. Um, sure. <laughs> those four times. And, um, but no, so if you're asking people to go lower, let's, let's actually take a step back and let's look at the coaching. And, and the people here at Seaford are actually quite fortunate, the fact that you've got fantastic coaches that are now coaching proper techniques to the children. So, so let's make sure that the coaches are prepared to coach the kids how to tackle properly, right shoulder, right, the right tackle technique, et cetera, et cetera. Um, bring the tackle height up a little bit. I mean, if it was below the nipple and I was playing now, it would still be about waist height. <laughs> but, in, but, in, but in fairness, it, it's, a physical, it's a physical game. We want our children. We want to watch. We want to watch men or women or or whichever whatever team we want to watch a competitive game we want to watch a combative game and and if you start taking that away and taking it away and taking it away we're going to lose the ethos of rugby we're going to lose that um why we're all sitting in here this evening or certainly the three of us uh i mean wince when he tackled it used to be below the eyebrow um and i just <laughs> I just think we, need, we just need to make, make the game safe, but still make it a credible sport that doesn't go too far away from its origination.
Okay, to be continued. Move on. Good, good. Um, yeah. Three distinguished careers. The absolute greatest moment of your career that you look back on, if you know, on, on, at that moment, if you only if you put your head on the pillow one night and thought, God, there was one moment when I was a legend. It was great, and I was fantastic. Craig, what was that moment for you when you, th you thought, this is my moment? Could be here a while. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> now, nah, listen, it, I was very, I, I played with, I was very young when I played for Scotland. I was 20 years old. I was very fortunate, fortunate to come into a team at a time with uh, some absolute legends, John Jeffrey, Finlay Calder, um, the Hastings sisters, Gavin and Scott. <laughs> or, or more affectionately known in Edinburgh as Dumb and Dumber. And uh, I, I can guarantee Gavin is definitely the most dumb of the two of them. But very lucky, good time to come in. But I always remember we were playing in Paris and we'd, we'd beaten Wales in the first game in 1989. We drew with England at Twickenham. We scored only a try that day, and back in those days it was uh, four points for a try, so I'm going to take that as a win. Uh, and then we, we humped Ireland at, uh, at Murrayfield, which we always did back in the 90s and uh, the late 80s. And then we uh, went to Paris, and we played France in Paris in the Parc de Prance with the bands, brass bands going, cockerels on the pitch. It was, you know, amazing atmosphere, you know, standing in the tunnel next to... Erbani, Rodriguez, all these massive French forwards greased up. Went on, getting an absolute hammering at halftime. 23 points to three we were getting beat. We were going for the championship in my first season. And uh, in those days, you didn't go to the changing room and get a, you know, your protein drink and do some video analysis. You got a tray of oranges. <laughs> ours, was, ours was spiked with whiskey. And yet... And uh, you came in a circle, and Scott Hastings in, the, in that circle, uh, Gavin Hastings in that circle. He wasn't the captain at the time, it was from the Calder. And uh, Gavin says, come on, boys, we can still win this. We're going to rise from the ashes like a pheasant. <laughs> and John, John Jeffrey was quite clever for a forward. He was actually a member of Mensa. <laughs> Did you know that, Wince? So was Wintz, I think. Uh, and uh, John goes... Uh, Wintz is a member of ASDA. <laughs> John, John, John says to Gavin, he goes, Gavin, do you not mean a phoenix? And he goes, yeah, I knew it was a bird beginning with letter F. <laughs> so I can, I, can, I can just certify that it is true what they say about the Hastings sisters. They are uh, not the brightest, but they are great lads. Uh, and they got me into an awful lot of trouble when I was 20 years old in my first season as a Scotland player. But, uh, yeah. What was the question? Yeah. What, what was the final score? Uh, listen, uh, I think when you get your first cap for Scotland, it's, it's always massive. And uh, mine was against Wales. Um, I think you've got to go back to the best game was... It's got to be 1990 for me, Grand Slam. Uh, sorry, Wentz. Sorry, Wentz. But it was, you know. It, Why does he know? have to say this? Every, every, every speech he makes. Were you playing that day? I didn't see you. He's been trying to catch me ever since. Um, it's better late the, than never. So watch out. <laughs> I'm driving you home tonight. Be careful. That's not a euphemism. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I think I think uh, 1990 is the last time Scotland won a Grand Slam. It was a it was a winner takes all game for the Grand Slam at Murrayfield, and uh, there's a recent uh, the, there's a book called The Grudge, and they just bought a program on BT Sport uh, called The Grudge, which they, which is free to. I'm sure you're mostly English in here, so you probably not what you probably won't watch it. Um, but yeah, that was a great day. That was a great day for us. The walkout, the atmosphere was amazing. Um, Maggie Thatcher was hated in Scotland. It was the poll tax time. We were the guinea pigs. Um, 
for the for the Thatcher government at the time, and it was a real there was a real hatred in the uh, in the in the stadium that day, and uh, yeah, we won 13-7 and won bugger all since. We'll, we'll come on to that in a minute. Although actually, of course, Scotland are England's bogey team at the moment, and it all starts at Twickenham next weekend. Wince, one one memory from your super illustrious career. Well, I mean. I, th I think really, really for for anyone who manages to play international sport, it, it's your first first cap, isn't it? You know, you know when I was talking about you know playing rugby in the dead ball area. I mean, all you think, all I was thinking about was actually playing for England. And uh, um, then, luckily enough, I I got picked. Um, it's quite a young age at 21, um, picked to play against Australia. Billy Beaumont was the captain. I mean, you know, it's going back a bit now, isn't it? Um, and um, so you, I was actually got a phone call from the, the secretary of the rugby union. I was working on the farm at the time and um, and I was, you know, milking the cows or doing something. And my my uncle came into the uh, to the cow shed and said, um, oh, can you do a few of these jobs? Can you go and muck out this and do, and do that? And uh, he said, oh, and by the way... Um, you've been picked to play for England against Australia. Um, and, uh, and I thought, oh, okay, thanks very much. You know? Because he walked out and I just went mad, didn't I? I was jumping all over the place, there were cows kicking me. I mean, how I ever made it to the game, I don't know. But uh, it was just uh, like that, that elation that, you know, suddenly it's, it's all, it's, God, it's what I've always wanted to do for, well, 21 years. And um, anyway, so get to the game. We're playing Australia, Jan the 2nd, 1982. And um, so Australia on, on tour over here. And, uh, you know, you think, well, build up to the game. You get down to the Petersham Hotel. You train with the lads. And, and there were some great guys in the team. You know, people like Clive Woodward, Steve Smith, Peter Wheeler, Bill Beaumont, obviously, as captain. And all, all the my sort of heroes that, that I... You know, looked up to for the last few years, um, watched on TV, suddenly you're, you're there. Um, and of course, you don't sleep that night. Uh, you know, you're trying to, but you, 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 but you don't, because you're just desperate to get out on the pitch. And, uh, and then, anyway, the game went pretty well. I got knocked out in the first half. Um, <laughs> so I don't really remember that. And that's a funny one, isn't it, with the old concussion nowadays? And uh, so I actually thought I'd tackled the Brenda Moon, the Australian winger, um, but I hadn't. Um, and I then staggered up and sort of waddled to the line out and it took me about five minutes to come around. But, but in those days, it was a sort of, you know, the guy ran on, the physio ran on with the cold sponge and shoved it all over your face and said, get on with it. And you sort of did. Um, and so we get to half time, and England, I think, well, I think we were winning at half time, and um, but Billy was a bit concerned that we weren't performing to the, the sort of standard that we should do, and so he said, "Right, lads," he said, uh, "He said, right, get in a group, get, come, come around." He said, uh, "Right now, I want you to concentrate." So now I'm like, and 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 one thing, a guy called Tony Neary, who was a sort of flanker ten years previous to me, who was a, a, a legend of the game, and he said one thing, when you do play your first cap you've got to concentrate because it goes like a flash. He said, you, you know, you, you run out on the pitch, next thing you're running off it and you just don't know what's happened because it's just, everything is just a blur. So uh, Billy said, concentrate. So I was going, right, I'm going to concentrate. And um, he said, like, come on, lads, for God's sake, concentrate. So I, suddenly the crowd started uh, erupting and I was looking towards the north end and there was a guy running on the pitch in a gorilla suit Right. And I thought, right, don't watch him because I've got to concentrate. <laughs> but <laughs> I mean, it's suddenly gone very old school, hasn't it? That's that. Uh, um, um, and Hendo, you've got to follow that. One moment from your career. My, uh, yeah, yeah. 
Okay, there are my first, so, my, there's uh, so many, so many things you're just struggling to pick one. I, I, let me, let, I'll, give, I'll give you, I'll give you the top four very quickly. My very first cap, <laughs> my very first cap. As Win said, when you get your first cap, it's magnificent. We played against Western Samoa. Uh, running out for the first time, winning your first Lions Test. I mean, for me, it was in 01 against the Aussies in Brisbane, taking on the best in the world in the back garden and smashing them was quite cool. Um, Obviously, being born a Catholic and not having the strongest of faith, even though my wife is a Eucharistic minister at the local church, meeting Pope John Paul II, scoring a hat-trick against Italy the following day and winning man of the match was quite cool. <laughs> but I think... <laughs> But I think the top one is, and we've all got a we've all got a uh, a local rugby club connection. We all uh, are associated with, have played for uh, Isha, and playing for Isha's second team on a Wednesday night against Cambridge University, coming on off the bench, uh, kicking my one and only drop goal that went over like a dying swan was probably my greatest moment and achievement in my life. Thank you very much. I know you're a very keen dancer, Hender, and you want to get on the floor. So, last round robin here, because the Six Nations starts on Saturday week. Uh, England playing Scotland, first match. Ireland uh, have got uh, Wales yeah. on the first weekend, so it's a fantastic first day. Um, yes or no all the way down. Winters, were England right to get rid of Eddie Jones, yes or no? Oh, yes. Craig? No. Endo? I couldn't care less. Okay. And, uh, <laughs> and, and England struggling to beat Scotland in recent years. So what's going to happen next weekend, Craig? Yeah, we've got, we've got, easiest, we've got an easiest game first. So, yeah, we'll shoot. We'll, yeah, we'll probably win again, I think. Uh, I think we've had a great record against England over the last five years. Um, three wins, a draw. One narrow defeat, but yeah, I think we're I think we're confident. You guys have got a lot of injuries at the moment. Um, Greg has decided to bring Finn Russell back in, so I think uh, you know, as long as, as long as he stay at the bar and not go out too many nights before the game, he, we should be fine. Um, he'd have been an absolute superstar in our day um, when we were out on Wednesday nights, Thursday nights before games, enjoying ourselves, and then rock up on a Saturday, and you know. And, and winning games, so I think uh, I think uh, Scotland will beat England in the first game. Um, Gen genuinely, why 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 would I, why would I not say that? We've beaten you the last two years. I mean, yeah. you've got four in five injuries. You've got new coaches have yeah. not been there before. Yeah. We've got experience right through our team, and we've got Finn Russell. He's going to put you to the sword by about fifteen points. It took him. Okay. Don't all rush to your online accounts on that. Pete, Pete what do you think? Uh, yeah, I, th I agree with Craig. I think Scotland um, have got a, a very, very settled side at the moment. Um, England are in all sorts of turmoil. New coach, a lot of injuries. Um, I think it's going to be an incredibly tough game down at Twickenham. And um, on the back of that, I'd say probably England by 30. <laughs> He's still suffering from that concussion that first game. <laughs> and of course, and of course, sitting here smugly, um, the Irishman from Kingston, who um, Dover, and uh, uh, Dover, who uh, who, Dover. who who are second favourites to win the World Cup, and uh, second favourites to win the Grand Slam, and what else? Have Ireland peaked too soon, or is this going to be the year when Irish rugby will finally come to the fore? <clears throat> Ladies and gentlemen, before I answer that question, um, could everyone please give a big round of applause for Mr. John Inverdale? I think he's been fantastic this season.
Which is, which is wonderful. Yes. Can I say there's a butt coming here, so don't worry about that. Which is wonderful, because he's normally gardening useless. Um, <laughs> he did mention earlier on that he's moved home. Um, so if anyone would like to send him a note, uh, Whispering Pines. <laughs> Whispering Pines. Care 40, home. 42 Slough Road. Room 47B. Just send it through, he'll be all right. Just a little something for you, John. A little something for you. Yeah. You're always giving. You're always giving. Um, what do I think this year? I think it's going to be a very close Six Nations. Very close Six Nations between two teams. No, in, in fairness, in fairness, Wales have going to have a bounce because Gatti... Gatti... I'm not just saying that because Sean's cooking me breakfast in the morning. Wales are going to get a bounce because of Gatti coming back and, and what he did previously with the team. I think the England team will have a bounce with Steve Borthwick coming back in because I've never heard anyone so inspirational when he speaks. <laughs> Scotland are a settled team and Finn Russell coming back in I think is magnificent. He's box office. There's a lot of bouncing going on here, but who's going to win? Well, it's, it's quite obvious, isn't it? France. It's quite obvious. <laughs> it's so obvious I don't need to mention. And looking forward to the World Cup. Now, um, we're in a very fortunate position. We've got England and France playing at uh, Lansdowne Road. And I think that home advantage could make the difference. I don't think there'll be a Grand Slam this year. I do expect Ireland to win the Six Nations this year because number one team, even without... Uh, Johnny Sexton, uh, unfortunately, he's had a door handle put on his cheek to pull out his uh, fractured cheekbone. If you haven't seen that, he hasn't played in ages. Tyke Furlong, a little bit injured. The pack stressed when they're talking about bigger packs. England have a bigger one. France have a bigger one. Uh, Scotland have a mobile one, not a bigger one. <laughs> and I think, uh, I think it'll be a close to him, but I do, I do expect Ireland to win the Six Nations this year. Looking forward to the World Cup. Number one world ranked, uh, ranked team in the world. Um, winning a test series in New Zealand is never easy. Did that. Beating South Africa, beating Australia, only losing two games last year. Going into a World Cup. We've never got past the quarterfinals. Do not back us to win it. <laughs> um, we, we could meander on late into the night but we have a sort of like time schedule to operate you, you can't you're tagged at whispering pines <laughs> so would you put your hands together please for peter winterbottom craig chalmers rob henderson <laughs> <laughs>